uh, presentation. Uh, and now our next uh, speaker will uh, will be Professor Dalia Helmi El Erunini, who uh, will talk to us about contributors to uh, macrophage activation uh, syndrome, which uh, uh, was uh, noticed in the previous uh, case. Uh, please, Professor Dalia. Thank you, Dr. Mohamed, for your um, kind introduction. And thank you, Dr. Hanan, for her kind invitation for me to share in this great uh, event. My talk is about different contributors of macrophage activation syndrome. Objectives of my lecture is to identify the pathophysiology of this complex situation, identification of different contributors to the development of mass, and uh, be familiar with the clinical and laboratory features of these disorders, and how can we manage macrophage activation syndrome. Macrophage activation syndrome is a severe, potentially fatal condition associated with excessive activation and the expansion of macrophages and T cells, leading to overwhelming inflammatory, hyperinflammatory actions and cytokine storm. In general, MASS is classified as a secondary hemophagocytic lymphohistocytosis, but occurring in the context of rheumatic disease. It occurs, has been reported to occur with all other rheumatic disease, but it is commonly complicating systemic juvenile idiopathic arthritis. But however, cases of systemic lupus erythematosus and Kawasaki disease have been reported to be complicated with macrophages activation syndrome. How could these um, complex situations come to the surface and present itself? X-ray is stored with failure to, to deliver apoptotic signals, leading to persistent expansion of uh, T cells and macrophages, secreting pro-inflammatory cytokines. This results in self-amplifying inflammatory activity and persistent inflammatory response. This continuous inflammatory uh, environment results in transient natural killer cell dysfunction. So if we can look at this uh, figure, there is a, a persistent stimulation of the cytotoxic T lymphocyte, resulting in excessive secretion of interferon gamma and granulocyte macrophages, calling stimulating factors, which are a potent activator of macrophages and potent stimulator of differentiation of the monocytes into macrophage. The activated macrophage in turn secrete excessive inflammatory cytokines, mainly interleukin-6, interleukin-1, interleukin-18, and tumor necrosis factor alpha, together with hemostatic tissue factor, which shares in the coagulopathy characterizing this disorder. Moreover, the macrophages, the activated macrophages, uh, express excessive scavenging receptor, termed the CD163, Actually, the CD163 overexpressed over the actively phagocytic macrophages explain why this disorder is characterized by hyperferritinemia. The CD163, it's captured the hemoglobin haptoglobin complex, which is acted upon inside the lysosome by heme oxygenase, liberating free iron, which is then sequestrated with the ferritin, meaning, meaning that uh, excess ferritin is needed in this situation. So what are the contributors to the development of macrophage activation syndrome? What leads to failure of the apoptotic signals and the persistent hyperinflammation of the, of the cytotoxic T lymphocyte? Active underlying disease, infectious agents, and genetic bank ground all contribute to the development of mass. Let's start with the active inflammation. The majority of macrophage activation syndrome occurring during active disease or at disease onset, meaning that uh, it's before starting or with starting treatment, so the immune system is hyperactive, not uh, controlled. There is excessive production of different pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, during the disease activity. And it is what it was found that the persistently high level of interleukin 6 results in excessive production of pro inflammatory cytokines and chemokines by activated macrophages, some sort of vicious circle, and ending in transient defect in natural killer cytotoxicity, resulting in persistent, activate, persistent antigen stimulation and failure to kill the target cell or the, foreign, uh, the self antigen uh, inciting the immune response. Uh, 
So coming to the infectious agents, the most prominent infectious agents involved in macrophages activation syndrome or secondary hemophagocytic lymphocytosis, and even in the primary hemophagocytic lymphocytosis is, vir uh, is virus, and namely herpes virus are the most common, predominantly time bar and CMV, but also herpes simplex virus and varicella zoster virus. These are DNA virus okay, that are very um, potent modulator of the immune response. Less frequently RNA virus, including different strain of influenza, HIV, dengue, hepatitis C, and actually hepatitis A virus is reported to few cases all over the world, inducing macrophage activation syndrome. Um, it's not only virus, but less commonly could be protozoal, could be mycobacteria, uh, could be pneumocystis gervasi, other uh, organisms can induce, but much less common than the viruses. Let's see this figure, how viruses contribute or predispose to the development of macrophage activation syndrome. How do they work on the immune system to change it into a cytokine storm producing persistent inflammation? So the virus can result in sustained infection, sustained pattern recognition receptor stimulation, namely toll-like receptor and node-like receptor, resulting in a persistent immune system activation. Also, it leads to suppression of the natural killer and cytotoxic, lymph uh, cytotoxic lymphocyte cytotoxicity. And this is through um, inhibition and uh, inhibition of certain activating uh, ligand to these uh, cells and decreasing some sort of a perforin expression and certain other protein involved in the apoptotic pathway on, in the natural killer site toxic T lymphocyte. Sometimes the viral, instead of our, in addition to infection of the classic cell, they cause infection of key HLH cell types like uh, infection of the dendritic cells, infection of the macrophages, infection of the natural killer uh, cells themselves, so disturbing the immune response. They escape the natural killer cell and cytotoxic T lymphocyte recognition. So they maintain infection and stimulation of the immune system. Inhibition of apoptosis, so maintaining long-lived uh, infected target cells. And interference with the host cytokines and chemokines balance through the virus itself secretes certain virokines and virochemokines, which interfere with the host cytokines and chemokines, leading to suppression of the key cells of the uh, involved in the apoptotic pathway and contraction of the immune response. So why the virus in a specific host resulting in this uh, picture or this phenotype. It is much more, very much related to the high viral load and we can see with the COVID as we see these uh, days, high viral load is associated with uh, stress, chronic stress on the immune system and uh, um, different mechanism evading the normal immune response to con the control and contract the immune response. Also, subclinical genetic defect in the immune cells is highly suggested in these patients. So what about the genetic background? Some patients with macrophage activation syndrome complicating uh, rheumatic disorder were found to have hypomorphic variants or heterozygous mutation in one or more of the known genes to, of, the, of the genes known to cause primary hemophagocytic lymphohistocytosis. However, um, unlike primary hemophagocytic lymphohistocytosis, the genetic effect in macrophage activation syndrome is predicting the risk of recurrence, not uh, affecting the phenotype. So it is not about like the, the primary hemophagocytic genotype phenotype, but rather it is uh, predicting that this patient is at risk for recurrence. And we can see that this girl, Sandy, she deserves genetic testing. So as we can see, is this patient at risk for recurrence or not? Being the trigger uh, to cause macrophage activation syndrome in this case is the uncontrolled activity of the disease and the hepatitis A virus, although hepatitis A is known um, to be a very rare uh, trigger for macrophage activation syndrome. And we can see that uh, um, her sister passed very normally without any complication. So it is not only about uh, hepatitis A virus, she must have another additional factor that results in this drastic presentation.
the clinical features, these patients uh, are, as I said, mainly presenting uh, with underlying active uh, rheumatic disorder. They have free, equal frequency and incidence on boys and girls, no racial predilection, and can occur at any age. Patients with a chronic condition become acutely ill with persistent fever, mental status changes, hepatosplenomegaly, and lymphadenopathy. The patients might present with balor anorexia, so a chronic patients acutely deteriorate. And you cannot correlate only this to the underlying active disorder. Mental status changes, seizures, and coma are most common seen as manifestation. It can involve the cardiopulmonary system with pericarditis, acute dilated cardiomyopathy, and up to ARDS. Hemorrhagic skin rashes, up to hematemesis, and rectal bleeding. And this girl had hematemesis. Renal involvement, oliguria, acute renal failure, nephrotic syndrome, and this patient has uh, um, nephrosis and some sort of nephritis associated with the macrophage activation uh, syndrome because it's uh, after resolution of the macrophage activation syndrome, everything ba returns back to normal. So it is not related to the fulminant hepatitis. It is not related to the stemic GIA. Once macrophage activation syndrome is controlled, everything back to normal. Transient and characteristic skin rash and maybe paniculitis. We have to know that these patients are at risk for mild subclinical mass, which can occur in as one third of patients with active systemic disease. How can we detect this? If a patient with systemic GIA or with active rheumatic disorder, and then his lab, he maintained his clinical presentation of the underlying disease, no change in the clinical features. But when you follow up his lab, you found that his platelet was like 700 seldom and then dropped to 400,000, and still he's suffering of activity. There is no control of his underlying disease. Mean that the drop of the platelet count is not related to control of the disease, but it is related to a simple underlying uh, active process ending might be into macrophage activation syndrome. Uh, the patients have uh, cytopenias, mainly affecting the uh, platelets and restorocytes. Some patients with systemic GIA maintain the leukocytosis at presentation. With disease progression, they turn to be more cytopenic. With the occurrence of coagulation, they have prolonged PT and PTT. The ESR is either low or normal, like we see in this girl, and it is related to the degree of hypovibrogenemia. CRB is persistently high. If you can see the blood chemistry going into the liver affection, we will see elevated serum transaminase, hyperbilirubinemia, hypoproteinemia, hypertriglyceridemia, hypofibrogenemia. Uh, we can see that if macrophage activation syndrome is that uh, the classic affection of the liver, we can see that it does not end in fulminant hepatitis, and serum ammonia is either normal or mildly elevated. In this girl, the condition worsened rapidly because there are different hitters for the liver, the macrophage activation syndrome, the hepatitis A, and the systemic GIA activity itself. These patients have elevated ferritin, and we can just, if we remember that I explained why, because the activated macrophages uh, display CD163, which is a scavenger for the iron to be uh, bound to the ferritin instead of being free to decrease the oxidative stress. Renal affection could occur, elevated D-dimer and elevated LDH. Histopathological examination, Virtually every organ can be infiltrated, but very commonly the bone marrow and the lymph nodes to be accessed. We will see tissue infiltration with T lymphocyte, actively phagocytic macrophages, and we can see hemophagocytosis, but absence of hemophagocytosis does not exclude the disease. And histological evaluation of the liver, um, per se, because of macrophage activation syndrome through so severe diffuse fatty changes in addition to infiltration with active macrophages in the sinusoidal and very portal areas. We can see the CSF moderate pleocytosis, immunological biomarker. This is a, a promising biomarker concerning accessing the soluble CD163 and measure the cytokines interleukin 18, interleukin 6 mainly. However, elevated soluble interleukin 2 receptor alpha CD25 is now available, and it is one of the criteria of uh, the HLH uh, 2004 classification criteria for uh, primary hemophagocytic lymphocytosis, uh, but it is not available in all labs.
So uh, can we simply just um, apply the revised diagnostic guidelines for HLH 2004 um, on patients with a childhood rheumatic disease concerning the clinical presentation of fever, splenomegaly, and the lab presentation of cytopenia, hypertriglyceridemia, hemophagocytosis, lower absent natural killer cell activity, ferritin, and elevated soluble CD25. These are very informative diagnostic criteria, but macrophage activation syndrome, although have similarities with the primary hemophagocytic lymphohistocytosis, but it some sort differ in the inflammatory, severely inflammatory background, and that uh, fibrinogen and platelet count uh, commonly affected very late in the um, course of the disease because they act as acute phase reactant. So in SLE, for example, autoimmune cytobenias are common and difficult to be distinguished from cytobenias caused by mass. How could uh, we suspect macrophage activation syndrome in a patient with SLE? If we can find that the patient's turn to have persistently high fever, increase the degree of malaise, and although he showed manifestations of uncontrolled disease, he has low ESR. Also, extreme hyperthreatinemia and LDH elevation would further, the, uh, sup would further support the diagnosis. So what about systemic GIA and other systemic vasculitis, the cardiacocytosis, thrombocytosis, increased fibrinogen level, and other acute phase reactants, how we can solve this problem? If I found that the decrease of the total leukocytic count and platelet count below the expected value for the disease, even if it is still within the normal range, I mean, if a patient with systemic GIA came and he has fever, okay, and his platelet count was 200, okay, this is normal, okay, but still it is not normal at all for a patient with systemic GIA. If I search for the patient has fever, 16, the, uh, there is a conjoint work between the EULAR, ACR, and BRAIN2 to put a classification criteria for a mass in GIA. So they suggest that if a patient suspected, it's not, there is no need for to be confirmed, even if suspected uh, systemic GIA, it means you exclude infection, exclude malignancy, and you found that he has persistent fever and serum ferritin exceeding 684, and any two of the following, platelet count less than 181, AST more than 48, triglycerides more than 156, and look at the fibrinogen, they, they put a higher threshold than that used by the HLH 2004 classification criteria. Why? Because fibrinogen is acute phase reactant in this disorder. We have in these patients to exclude infectious causes or familial hyperlipidemia. So what about treatment? This is a life-threatening situation, and we can see that we have to give high-dose corticosteroids, pulsed missile brednisolone, aiming to control the cytokine storm and as well as to control the disease activity. If it, the thing is controlled, we can give oral steroids. Some patients with moderate cases, we can start with dexamethasone. Parental administration of cyclosporin A is very effective, causing very rapid improvement within 12 to 24 hours from initiation and then to be followed by maintenance oral cyclosporin A. Cyclosporin should be gradually tapered off and not uh, uh, suddenly withdrawn because it can result in relapse. But unfortunately, this is not the story in every patient. Some patients are resistant to the steroid and cyclosporin. Um, we, as a pediatric immunologist and rheumatologist, we do not favor etoposide, but we are um, obliged to use in resistant cases, and it is used in the same doses and same regimen as the HLH 2004 treatment protocol. Coming to the biological therapy, um, in patients, um, um, some certain prefer to use anti-simocyte globulins instead of etoposide in steroid and cyclosporin resistant cases. Intravenous immunoglobulin may be beneficial if it is driven by viral infection, as our case. I prefer to give her intravenous immunoglobulin together with the dexamethasone. Anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody, uh, rituximab, in case of Epstein bar virus triggered mass. Um, some case reports investigating the role of interleukin 1 blocking therapy, anakinra and, and kanakinumab. Interleukin 6 receptor antagonist to zilozumab. 
and Jack inhibitor uh, tofstinib uh, as a part of to suppress the stat and suppress the vicious circle of T cell activation and macrophage activation. And it is very important that we use it as a step approach. Okay, so um, in primary HLH, they use the whole protocol, dexamethasone and uh, etoposide at the same uh, time. But in uh, microphage activation syndrome, we use steroids. If controlled, okay. If not controlled, like this case, we resorted to uh, adding cyclosporin intravenous. If not, we add other drugs. Um, I would like to acknowledge my uh, team in the Pediatric Allergy Immunology Unit, founded by Professor, our beloved Professor, Professor Dr. Yahya Gamal, and headed now by uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Shireen. Um, I'm very um, thankful and appreciating all your efforts to give the best uh, for our patients. May Allah cure them all, and thank you for your um, attention. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Dalia El Wanini, for a, a very scientific uh, presentation uh, that was really elaborate and really uh, educational. Uh, before we start uh, our question and answer session, may I?